everyone who is trickling in to spend their afternoon with us. And it should be afternoon regardless as to where you are, assuming you're in the continental North America. Really appreciate everyone who's been tuning in to the Dismantle Preservation Unconference this week. All right, we are live on YouTube. So everyone, thank you so much for joining us for the final session of the 2021 Dismantle Preservation Unconference titled The Preservation Revolution for Early Preservationists. This entire week has been made free thanks to the support of the Alpha Wood Foundation, Museum Hack, and Eileen and Norman Tyler. And while this event has been entirely free, we are encouraging you to find ways to support the nonprofits, the fundraisers, all of the activities Activities that you've been learning about this week through our presentations. And there are also five pre-identified nonprofits and fundraisers that you are being encouraged to support. These are Latinos in Heritage Conservation, Asian and Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation, um, House of Tulip, the Decay Devils, and Apache Passion Project. All of these endeavors are pushing preservation forward and the cultural resource field in new or exciting, but all of them in meaningful directions and making the change happen that we want to see like all of the discussions that have been happening this week. And I've also just been pleased as punch this week um, for us to use the unconference this year as a way to amplify the voices of students, recent graduates and grassroots activists. It's really important that all of these wonderful people are giving the platform to showcase the invaluable work they're doing to change what the preservation movement looks like in a positive way. So thank you everyone for being here. I am gonna be quiet and let our panelists take it away. Hi everyone, my name is Jose Richard Aviles and again, thank you so much for being a part of this amazing panel. And I am so honored to be a part of this conversation as someone who's not a preservationist, but rather has an interest in the field and works very tangentially, tangentially to it. But there's so much intersection that I appreciate it. So I, per, perfect urban planner, right? I'm literally in the built environment in Mexico City at Roma Norte. And before we dive into a little bit more what this conversation is about, I want to talk to you a little bit about resiliency. What does resiliency even look like, right? So I am a social worker and an urban planner and an artist, and somehow all of those three things just make sense in my mind, right? In social work, there you see cars coming through. In social work, we talk about resiliency as a, a community's ability to adapt to external forces that are, that are affecting community. A lot of the time when we talk about resiliency, this is in reaction to either natural disasters, um, this might be in relationship to changes in the built environment, right? And then resiliency refers to a community's ability to adapt and still continue to thrive, right? Now, what does that even look like in urban planning? So one of the things that I just primarily focus on is on the intersections of trauma and the built environment. And I think preservationists know this exactly really well, that we have, there is a, a, a relationship between how our identity is formed based on our relationship to the built environment. A femme from South Central, it's not a femme from West Hollywood. <laughs> Very different. Oh, that's in context to Los Angeles where I'm from. Sorry, y'all. But so that relationship, right, the idea behind identity and the built environment to me is very important and very in, in, in something that I works towards. So when I think about my work as an urban planner, I think about how do, are we designing cities and communities to be resilient? And a lot of the times, especially as planners, we think we know what resiliency means, but we haven't even asked the community what resiliency looks like, right? So we may think we're building resilient communities and communities are like, we've been resilient. We are people of color who are surviving because of your racist urban policies, resiliency. <laughs> One of the most interesting things, and to me, what I find so fascinating about preservation, and I'm grateful to my colleagues on this panel for inviting me so I can, you know, be a part of the conversation, really be a chismosa, be that señora, like I want to know more. It's, it's how resiliency also just doesn't just live in the built environment, but it lives in the, in the lived environment, right? One of the most beautiful things that, that I get to experience while being in Mexico City I'm literally, you know, the challenge of immigrants who came to Mexico City in the hopes of finding their roots, and I only came to discover how privileged I really am. But I get to see the resiliency of indigenous work. I get to see the resiliency of ancestors that reflected my skin color through the use of the maize and the tortillas, 
through the way that tacos are made, through enchiladas, through the slang, through the fact that there's El Templo Mayor right next to colonial architecture. And that juxtaposition reminds us that resiliency doesn't just exist in the built environment, but it also exists in the lived environment. So as we move forward and have these conversations, I'm going to turn it over to the rest of my colleagues. And let's think about how resiliency is already present and how do we as planners, preservationists, just amplify it, highlight it, and advocate for it. Love it. Love it. Well, first, let's start off with the cheers. If you didn't know, this is a happy hour. Oh, so excited to be drinking at four on a Friday. <laughs> well, in the spirit Wait, of- quick, can, can I interject right quick? Can we do that cheer again? And can I take the screenshot? Because I'm on my phone and it looks gone. <laughs> Oh, oh, I can't do the screenshot of the kids. Oh, man. Shoot. I got it. Can, 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 can. Okay. <laughs> well, cheers. And in the spirit of an unconference, this format breaks with tradition, and we're calling it an unpanel in a way. And I think that panels can convey a sense of authority, and they can only give a minor breakdown of barriers between the audience and its panelists. And even if you have a Q&A portion, there's this idea of almost celebrity, I think, and less so of an exchange. And most notably, there's often one moderator who's guiding the conversation and kind of acting like a liaison between the two groups. But there's something about that format in particular in the context of the five days of the unconference and in the context of what the four of us are doing in our work that doesn't really allow for the exchange and the knowledge sharing and the informality that I think all of us are working towards in our preservation revolution. So today's on panel has opened up with this concept of resiliency. And I think that goes hand in hand with revolution. The four of us represent our different fields, our different backgrounds, and the idea of resiliency in whatever we're doing and whatever we want to be doing. And we chose this idea of a revolution because in all the things we've been doing in the past two years, whether it's task force work, we're on a panel, we're in discussions with our peers, we've consistently seen this pattern of young preservationists or adjacent fields who are mostly people of color struggling in our field from an educational level, a professional level, a mental health level, and also doing amazing work on their own and in their own way. So we thought, you know, if the system as is, isn't working for us and what we need and what we want, then what we need is a revolution. And I think what's incredible about this group in particular, the four of us, is that when we all met each other virtually for just 20 minutes, we instantly clicked and there was this instant camaraderie, this instant recognition of resiliency with one, within one another and leadership and this power that we all have to change our fields in the smallest and the biggest ways. And I also noticed how informal and comfortable we were with one another almost immediately. And I think it's unique and special to find a group of people who do the similar work that you do, who look similar to you, who you feel comfortable with. And that comfort allowed us to try something new for this on panel, which is to make it a happy hour. So we're cheersing if you haven't cheers yet. Um, and although each of us do really important work where we stress the negative experiences we might have in our fields and we stress injustice and inequality, we're also very aware that you must take time to celebrate. And marginalization doesn't just mean unhappiness. You can discuss your work and your sadness and your joy all at once and express the things that you want to express in the way that you want to express them in a less prescribed colonized format. And I think some folks might disagree with, you know, drinking and talking about racism and city planning, but we really want to get used to the idea of questioning everything. And that includes the way we retain information. It includes the way we learn and receive and give information. So for our happy hour, each of us has chosen a drink that might represent resiliency or revolution, or that's a little important to us. And we can talk about that in our introductions. Um, we also chose not to have a specific moderator for our conversation. We're going to ask each other questions because it's a knowledge share. Sharing. We're learning from one another as well. And we'll talk about um, our own experiences of a revolution, what a revolution might look like, and introduce those concepts of resiliency, race, ethnicity, queerness, so many other important issues that are embedded uh, in the work that we do. So please feel free to ask those questions throughout. I know we're doing a Q&A after, that's totally okay, but if you want to throw questions in the chat, if you're able to, that's fine. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Eduardo, who's going to give a bit of background about how we all came to be, and then we can dive in. Hi everyone. Um, um, so I want to tell a little bit how this group came together. Um, Taylor and I, we both went to a historic preservation school and we went to the same uh, 
at the same period. And we quickly learned how much our curriculum was centered in the colonizer, in the white narratives of the history, right? And we didn't learn anything about like the RPOC communities, LGBTQ plus history, feminism, or social justice. And as time passed, we saw that the issue was more profound than we thought. We felt lonely, we felt left out, and we felt like we didn't belong to preservation. And it became increasingly difficult to advocate for the discussion of untold stories in the classroom. And we felt like uh, there was nothing in there for us. And we look around, there was no one that looked like us in preservation, in the field of preservation, in the field of history. And um, in our fight to add, a, to add some, some social justice and some other stories for our curriculum, um, that was really frustrating for us because we were like bring discussions to the classroom and the discussions were really like go to the opposite side of what we wanted or what we expected. And we um, had to sit down and listen to like racist statements and people being completely um, unfamiliar with the struggles of being a person of color or an LGBT person or anything different than white and uh, work for preservation. So uh, we started looking, doing our own research, right? Taylor and I, we presented so many assignments in social justice and our, our classmates, they were like tired of us already because every single assignment that we had, every single presentation that we had a chance, we would include something and bring the discussion to the classroom because we wanted, that's, we were eager to hear more, to hear like this other side of history that we are not learning from our professors. And that was the pivotal moment that we started like looking further from what the professors were telling us. And that's when we found this amazing network of people doing the revolution. We saw that the revolution has already started and there were people doing it. And that was the moment that we found joy and we felt like, yes, we belong to preservation and that is what we want to do. And uh, we see, we saw ourselves in, in preservation. And that's when we found joy in the work of uh, Jose Richard Avalis and Lacey Wilson, because um, they are doing the work that we want to do. We, we looked uh, up to them and we were like, yes, this is what we want. And we are so honored to have them here today <clears throat> to have Preservation Society uh, join them today in this panel. And, um, but that's enough background. I will ask each of us to uh, introduce ourselves. And uh, Lacey, why don't you introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your work and what you want to talk about today. Sure, uh, my name is Lacey Wilson. I am uh, also public, uh, I am a preservationist adjacent. I'm the public historian of the group. I'm happy to be here. Always appreciate hanging with my preservation cousins, as I always consider us. Um, I got my master's degree in public history in history with the Conservation Museum Studies at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro in 2018, and I'd gotten my bachelor's in history in the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, I've done a lot of work in academic and professional in outreach and in historic interpretation and in lifting up the voices of people who are actually most important in these scenarios most notably recognized by the New York Times when I worked at the Owens Thomas House and Slave Quarters uh, talking about the enslaved people on the property of which there were far more than the people who were enslaving them. And those were the stories that were most interesting to me. And we could tell by, I was just an interpreter there, but we could tell by the people who were coming there specifically as opposed to other places that didn't focus on those stories in Savannah, that that was something that other people clearly cared about as well. Um, very active on Twitter, very active in terms of in trying to see how museums, public humanities, public history, public art can all be further involved in moving us forward in a variety of ways, uh, inspired by a lot of the activists that we can see here and a lot of the stories that we're having. Um, I, I think that's enough for now, but I do very much resonate with the fact that the revolution's already begun and we're just really putting words to it and recognizing that that's actually happening, just jumping on the train while it's still moving. Hi, uh, Taylor, do you want to go next? Yes, I'll go next. Uh, hi, everyone. Taylor K. Berry. I run Preservation Side B with Ed Wardo. We graduated in 2019 from Pratt Institute. 
Historic Preservation had a terrible time getting my degree, <laughs> as Eduardo nicely put it, but I'll be just real honest with you, I did not have a good time there. And it took a couple years to, and I've only been graduate for two years, but it took longer than I'd like to actually love the field again. Um, I did a Greenwood Cemetery, which is a cemetery in Brooklyn internship. And Eduardo and I, ha I have had like four of the same jobs together. So <laughs> we're together for life, apparently. Um, and yeah, so I don't work in preservation now. Preservation side B is my side project, but I don't do it to get paid. And I thought about going to get my PhD, didn't really get into schools and then really thought about it. And I was like, oh, I don't think the academic is tr track is for me. Like what's gonna change in going somewhere else when I had the worst experience I could possibly imagine and then also be in debt. Uh, so right now I'm working on ways to figure out how to put my, my own work out in a way that it works for me. So not working with this like colonized format of like, do I need to write a paper? Do I need to write a whole dissertation and go to school and get these validation from the people when I'm trying to start my own revolution? So what does the revolution look like for me and my work that I'm doing and I'm really interested in uh, something that came up like my first year in grad school, which is legacy planning or like the legacy of the myth. Like what does it mean to see racism and inequality built into the literal streets it built into the landscape? That's something that I'm fascinated by. I love the idea of maps and like being able to figure out what values someone has based on the type of maps they have, how that differs in indigenous cultures and colonized cultures. Ugh, love it. So that's what I'm working on currently and more to come. Richard, you wanna go next? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Jose Richard Aviles. I'll, I'll keep my short, you already heard from me, uh, but I am an artist, uh, social worker, and urban planner. And uh, recently, professionally, I was at the Department of Transportation for the last two years. Um, it was interesting working within the government. Uh, I'm a firm believer of organizing contra desde sin el estado, which translates to against, within, without the state. And though I was working within the state, my spirit is always against the state. Um, and to kind of what Taylor was saying, right, I think I've also considered a PhD in urban planning. And as I started writing the statement of purpose, I'm not going to lie, I literally, I'm going to pull on my, oh, oh my God, I almost spilled the drink, y'all, uh, which we can't do. But as I started thinking, writing a statement of purpose, I realized that I was trying to, starting to justify my existence in academia. And I was like, no, I did that in undergrad. I did that in graduate school. I'm not doing this in, in, for a PhD program. I was like, I want to make this university feel stupid for not having me because I'm I'm, I'm bomb. I'm a badass. Um, and you'll hear a lot of cursing on my end because professionalism is a construct of white supremacy. And Taylor's like, I know. <laughs> um, and so to me now, and I think something very important, and Taylor, girl, let's talk about collaborating because I found that art can become the antithesis to bureaucracy. So I get to say whatever I want as an artist because it's my art and it's my lived experience. And I think specifically as artists, we're living in this in this in this epoch of art that I'm calling the counter narrative. We have already come to understand that the white man as a model of art and a trope of art outdated. Like, look at Michelangelo, outdated. Like, get out of here, you know. But anything that becomes the antithesis to that becomes a counter narrative. So I think there's a wonderful opportunity. I think that's what drew me a lot to preservation. That it was a it's an interesting way of professionalizing storytelling through this bureaucratic framework. But then I found out about the white ladies and Mount Vernon. And I was like, oh, can we talk about like your obsession with this man? Hold on, white ladies. Um, but I, what I will say, what I do find interesting as a planner is a level of advocacy and organizing that preservation is has. And there's something about that, that it's like, there's this level of capacity that these folks have around whatever building they're trying to preserve, around whatever white narrative they're trying to preserve. And that's something interesting that it's like, how do I empower my community to treat me with the same comportment that these white women do? And so to me, I've always found that fascinating. Um, and I'll leave it at that. I, current, I now work at the Institute of uh, other than a belonging institute out of UC Berkeley. And that's been really fun, again, thinking about equity and transportation. But right now, my passion is always art. I'm currently working on this project called the Busqueda de la Malinche. That's a whole other mouthful. But it's looking at the relationship between my queer brown identity in the US in comparison to my queer brown identity in Mexico City, because I am not the same person in two different countries. And that intersection to me is quite fascinating. So I think Lacey, Value. you oh wait who's who's next no lacy already went eduardo <laughs> 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 
Sorry. No worries. Thank you. Um, so my name is Eduardo. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I am an architect from Brazil. I have a bachelor's in architecture and urban planning. And I moved to the US in 2017, if I'm not wrong. Yes, 2017, uh, to get my master's in historic preservation. Uh, now I work with uh, community organizations, community-based organizations. And um, my view of preservation, I love preservation. I don't love preservation the way it is. I don't love the National Register. I do not love the, the national parks, whatever they call themselves. Um, I love community-based uh, preservation. I like to see how the community tries, how they protect their environment, how they create their own environment and how they use their own environment. This for me is preservation. It's way more than a list of buildings that need protection because Abraham Lincoln once looked at a building, this building now needs to be saved. That's not preservation for me. Uh, preservation for me is not Jack uh, Jack O'Kennedy trying to save uh, save Central Park. It's something way different than that. And um, I'm very happy to be in this event, this mental preservation and, and conference, because I think my views of what preservation is are very aligned to what we, what uh, the event has been discussing so far. And um, I'm very happy to be here with the panelists, with Taylor, Lacey, and uh, Richard, because. I think we have what it needs to plan the revolution that we are looking for. So uh, let's start planning the revolution for preservation. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about my drink. I am drinking caipirinha. So I am Brazilian and caipirinha is the national drink of Brazil. But it does have like a bittersweet um, uh, history because caipirinha is made of uh, cachaça, which is a rum made out of uh, sugarcane. And uh, uh, cachaça was the first distillate in the Americas to be made on a large scale and to have economic uh, relevance. So the economy of Brazil thrived on the production of cachaça. But the economy thrived in the production of cachaça, but cachaça was being, uh, sugarcane was being uh, produced by enslaved people. So at the same time that Cachaça has a very, it's very important for the economy of my country. We have this uh, other side of history that is not that pretty. The, um, the country does not make, uh, make known to the, to the rest of the world. When they say caipirinha is our drink, it's lays made. That's not, the, <laughs> that's not the, the, the line. But the country likes to say like caipirinha is delicious, come and drink it. And for me, preservation is this bittersweet, is this reckoning with your history because there's no one cycle of history. And for me, historic preservation has this power, has this ability, it has the responsibility to tell all sides of history. So if you say, come and drink cachaça because it's delicious, you can also say, come and drink is delicious, but we recognize that the history of this drink, it's not what we want and we, we need to face it. So um, if somebody else wants to talk about their drink, cheers. I'll, I'll talk about my drink um, briefly. So I am drinking, you know, I don't know what the drink is called, <laughs> but it has a mezcal based in it. So I, I don't know too much of the history, but I love this tale. And because we're talking about heritage conservation and like, don't get me started on epistemologies of history. And Eduardo said it quite well. This is my truth. So the story goes that indigenous folk discovered mezcal. Mezcal comes from agave, which is a plant uh, that where the, where the mezcal is fermented. The Spanish came, couldn't handle the mezcal and invented tequila <laughs> because mezcal is stronger and smokier than tequila. But they come from the same plant. It's just fermented in a different process. So this is a mezcal-based um, drink. And I just literally just love the fact that I'm outside of a restaurant. So that's my drink. I can go next. Mine isn't very history based, though. I'm drinking a dark and stormy um, because these are ingredients that I normally already have in my apartment and I did not get a chance to go and purchase. I was going to try to see if I could find the scale in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I hadn't before. I thought this was my chance, did not get the chance this time. Um, so I'm drinking a dark and stormy. Um, my relation to this drink is that this was the drink that I drank at my first academic conference. Um, 
as an undergrad, 22 years old, I uh, went to the Association for African American History and Life. Um, I had convinced two friends of mine, a friend of mine, and acquaintance of mine, to do this. Um, we would. We'd, I thought I'd found an essay contest, and it would be easy money for me for a top paper I'd already written. In actuality, I found myself signing up to do a panel as an undergrad, and was very intimidated. Um, you can ask me about it later, but I did do my paper on Addie the American Girl story, obviously. Um, and this was a drink that I had in that hotel bar right at, not too long after, right the night before that presentation. And so it just has a lot of sentimental feelings for me for those reasons. I love that. Cheers. Um, I'm having, I thought long and hard about my drink. And I'm really excited about it because it just tried it for the first time. It's really good. I wanted to do something that represented resilience and revolution. And uh, um, a while ago, like one of our first side B projects was that's Brooklyn was on um, like red drink and that could be hibiscus. It's mostly hibiscus based, but it's cross culture. Like wherever you go in the US, like black people know what red drink is. Like you might have a different name for it. And I love hibiscus. So I knew I wanted to do something hibiscus based to represent that diaspora, that resiliency, like no matter where you go, you have this thing in common. And then I thought about rum and like the history behind rum and plantations and sugarcane and I hate rum I hate it so much but I was like I'm gonna do it it's probably gonna be so good so I mix it up I mix it in my blender and I'm drinking rum and hibiscus and it's highly recommend that's my revolution cocktail um, I think we should get started so we had a really good question and also some compliments on the earrings which I love uh, someone asked based on all of your experiences within and outside of the institutions what would you say to young people slash professionals in the field who want to break out of institutional status quo but are afraid of retaliation? Amazing question. Um, does anyone want to take it first? Because I feel I see everyone's faces lighting up. Um, retaliation triggered me, so I'll, I'll add something. Um, I got some tea, y'all. Tea. Why, why we gotta do a cocktail drink? You know we gonna spill all the tea. I listen. I'm all about spilling the tea, especially against institutions, because I'm committed to people and never institutions. But I mean, I had a moment where like literally a city council in LA tried to get me fired because I was like, you're not doing your job. I think that retaliation is very true. And I think one of the things that I found very disappointing in my urban planning program is that no one prepared me for that. No one told me, listen, yes, you are, are passionate about city. You're trying to defend neighborhood. You're trying to ensure that your neighborhood is being taken care of, that it's being developed, that, it's, that folks are not homeless, all those different things but nobody trains you to how to play the politic of the game or the game of the politics of politics. I'm sorry. And so I think one of the things that I did learn is that at least for myself, please count me in your network. Like I have your back. If there's something that my mentors have taught me is that in front of them and in them as white people, you are perfect. But between us, I'm going to check you if I have to. You know what I mean? Because we serve a bigger purpose. And I think that that network of people, like the people who have, have had my back in the field, have been other planners of color because a lot of our why is the same. We, we recognize, we have the lived experience of how racist urban policies have affected our communities. And, you know, I think that having that strong network was very important, um, especially because retaliation can be a little scary. I totally agree. And I think it's a very good question. And it's like hard to break through. I still haven't, I, I haven't uh, break through this uh, fear. So I also want to get a PhD and I tried last year and I got like a beautiful letter from my professor saying like, you almost got it, you should apply again. And I was like, but should I, I'm tired of almost getting it. And like, uh, I understand that in the field, like I'm applying for very high uh, names, like Harvard, uh, UCLA, and all those famous schools, just because I was thinking that I need to play the game to get into, uh, to land in that, that, that dream job. But as time passes, I'm like, do I need this? Do I want to apply to this? Or if I do the work myself, I'll be able to get it, to get there. And I, I am getting to the realization that if I do the work myself, I will be way happier if I get there or if I don't get there. I would be way happier if I do my PhD and for some reason I do not get to that, I do not land to that dream job that uh, the PhD is supposed to give you, right? So um, I think it takes a lot of uh, thinking and processing 
And maybe I also think like this breakthrough, this uh, F of institutions is not for everyone. And I think it's like case by case, you, you have to sit down and think, do I want there? Do I want this title? Do I want to be associated with this institution? Or, do, or am I just playing this game that has been played for centuries that I need this very shiny name in my institution, my, my curriculum to get to where I want to get? So um, yeah, I think it's a lot of processing and a lot of um, planning because you have to plan. Like, like you, you cannot like just leave your career and be like, cap and career, career come to me. You, you have to work for it. But that's a very good question. And I don't know if I answered. <laughs> I think that was a good answer. Um, I think what I would add to that is you as a young person, and I'm going to say young, is just like new to whatever field adjacent to this. It's not necessarily age. People come into this at all kinds of levels. But you, if you know what y your interest is in terms of joining this field, in terms of what you want to do, what you value, what you're interested in. Just because people around you don't necessarily know it doesn't mean that it's not a space for you. I spent a good portion of my two years at UNCG telling other students, I want to do uh, interpretation and outreach because I want the museum to serve the people. And I would say it in like this very long sentence. And then I would go look up jobs and jobs didn't say that specifically. Like outreach was a separate thing from interpretation. It's not that those jobs didn't exist. It's just that I didn't have a language for it. And just because the people around me didn't understand that that's what I was interested in, that's what I was trying to communicate, doesn't mean that what I'm interested in the field doesn't exist out there and I can't, or I can't make it. Being able to vocalize and figure out the words and find the things that you're interested in are, is very important. And I would encourage you just to keep going with what you're interested in and you will find the thing outside of an institution or within an institution that makes sense for you, that works in that instance. I also highly recommend balance. I think something that'll come up a lot in our conversation is the revolution of rest. Y'all need to chill sometimes and just let your body rest because otherwise you will overwork yourself and it is too much. We are human, healthcare is expensive. You need to rest sometimes. Uh, it's something that I keep having to remind myself and I have good friends who remind me more forcefully than I will remind myself as well. And so being able to figure out that balance is important in all areas. When I was doing those tours in Savannah, I was doing them three to five times a day, five days a week um, for like 40 minute guided tour to a variety of visitors. But a lot of them were just drunk people who came to Savannah because they can drink in the street. And we ended up on my tour where I wanted to talk to them about enslavement and political history, all very important. When I was not at work, I made friends with improvisers who just did comedy regularly. And I'm just like, I'm gonna go listen to them make jokes because this is the right rest for me right now. Was I spending a lot of money at them? Yes, but they were community organization and they had kids and it was the right way. Being able to find that balance for you as a young professional, no matter where you identify in that young professional is crucial. So I would say uh, find a way to rest as well as keep going with what you're interested in because those places will find you or you'll find them. Can I, I just add something right quick? Lacey, you said something that, that triggered my mind, right? Between what, even if, if, if there isn't a space for you, like, you know why you can't, like that bit right there. And yeah. I think it's because we, we become translators from our lived experience to the technical experience, but always ensuring that the lived experience is always valued greater than the technical experience because no one can take that away from us, right? Girl, send me 50 articles about equity, but like, I know, I live this body. Welcome to my life. You know what I mean? And I think it's something very powerful. If nobody gets what you're trying to do, like nobody really understood the intersection between social work and urban planning. And for me, it was like, look, I think there's a lot of space for advocacy within urban planning, but nobody is teaching us to be advocates. So we need a course called Community Organizing for Urban Planners. Well, guess what? She just got hired to teach at UCLA in the spring. <laughs> So, I mean, it was like, it can't be that, right? I'm like, y'all, y'all don't even want to have me as a professor because, you know, I'm like, whatever. But I think to what Lacey said, that, that, that power to translate, it's super important. And I think the balance and understanding the value is how we stay ensured of what we're looking forward to. Um, so that was it. Um, I have a follow-up question. Like, in that preservation revolution that we are planning, where do institutions fit? 
like how uh, educational institutions where do we need a degree to be a preservationist or everyone is a preservationist? So I want to ask the group, like, how do how are we going to manage manage institutions once we are we establish our revolution? Everybody's <laughs> face is reacting and no one's saying anything. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> my, my, my face was like, yo, the revolution does not live in institution. Yo, <laughs> my revolution does not live in institution. My revolution lives in the streets. My revolution lives in the señoras. My revolution lives in the chisme. My revolution lives in joy. In the moment that you feel that you're being conditioned to protect the system you vowed to dismantle, fuck that. Move out. Oh, yo, I, sorry. That's all I say. What I was going to phrase was like either they advance to the point where they realize that they themselves are not needed or the, or we're done with them because like we need to act it, the importance of what we're doing in preservation and public history and public humanities and all of these adjacent things. The importance of them is not necessarily the fact that there's an administration in a building that knows what we're doing. That's not the important thing. The important thing is that the community around us approve and are have buy-in and are engaged with what we're doing. That's the important thing. That's the community, that's the administration, that's the institution I care the most about. And the community is too varied to be an institution. Uh Yes, plus one to what everyone was saying. Um, I do want to touch on this fact about gatekeeping, though. Like, I know we're talking about, you know, the community as as our institution in a way. Like, the revolution does not live in the institution. And I do want to, like, share a little bit of my experience of retaliation because we're here in, at this point in our careers where we're like, fuck it, don't get a PhD, don't do this, don't do that, we're confident. I wasn't there two years ago. When I was a student, if I had heard this panel, my whole life would have, like my mental health would have changed, everything would have changed. I was not at that point. So I also want to take it down a level and be real with you. Like it sucks and it's real and it's shitty and I almost didn't graduate and I almost gave up forever, but you have, there is a community and there's this idea of gatekeeping that institution has, that white people have, where they think that they are the be all end all of everything, right? And they did a very good job at brainwashing me, like mentally taking me down constantly every step of the way to tell you this is the only way that you can do preservation. And I had people in my ear like, oh, look for this community, go with this community or go with this community or, but I was so convinced that I would never get a job in preservation if I went against these people. And I think it's still true. Like, I think I'm still retaliated against, even though I work with the very institution doing anti-racism task force training that try to deny me my thesis and my graduation but like that those things are very real and you you might experience them like I want to be very real with you we were talking with a student who was wondering if she should get her master's degree at the institution that we went to and we we were careful about it but I wanted to just say like don't do it and I and that's not for everyone like I think that you can make a decision on your own but I also want to be really real with folks like we're at this point where we've been through hell and back and we can tell you like it gets better but you need to have that community you need to know your value you need to know your worth you need to know the work that you do you need to find somebody at your institution if that's what you want to do you need to find somebody in the field that's going to have your back because if you don't have it it's going to be really hard and i can genuinely say i would not have graduated if it wasn't for eduardo like if i didn't have him in my class going through it with me and if i was alone constantly like crying after class because damn my professor said something racist my thesis advisor said i can't talk about racism in my thesis like like what what would I do if I didn't have that community there and I feel so special like and privileged to be able to be on this panel and to be with these folks but I think it's a wonderful question I and I want to be real like don't be afraid of retaliation but expect it in like the shittiest way possible and be prepared for it that's all I have to say about that uh does anyone like does some is there any questions from the panelists or does someone else have a question well, someone asked a question that I will read it. Uh, I think it's a great question. Someone asked, so how do we create a community of care, not just for those experiencing retaliation, but also those who are living with that trauma and trying to work against it outside and inside the institution? The only thing I'll say, and this is why to me, my art is everything. Um, you know, I, I had to understand the hard way 
the things that I could and couldn't say within institutions. Like I was the person that sent it like a, a LA City email that said, there are deficiencies at this intersection. It is thundering in Mexico City now. Um, and, you know, my supervisor was like, uh, Jose Richard, um, so you wrote the word uh, deficiency in an email. So if the family decides to sue, they're going to look at this email and we're going to be at fault. And I was like, I mean, okay, but like, there was a deficiency. Like, I'm not here to be like, advocate for the city. I'm here to advocate for residents. I just work in the city. And so I think I learned that. And since that moment, I was like, okay, she got to pay bills because when you're a person of color and you come from low income communities, I don't got no safety net. Like, I have to be very mindful of what I can and can't do. And some of the things that I've learned to do, and this can sound sometimes a little bit wild, but I compartmentalize my life. I what I do professionally, I do professionally and I work very hard and try to ask questions and make mistakes to ensure that my work could speak for itself. And then everything else that I can say within work, I say in art because my art is mine. It's my lived experience and no one can cancel me on my truth. Um, and so I, for me, it's that balance between like, okay, what is something that, that brings me joy? Because I think a lot what happens in our life and it, it's currently happening in society we're doing a lot of trauma bonding and I'm ready for that joy bonding. I'm ready for that healing bonding. Let us recognize each other through our trauma. But act, if you want to bond over something, let it be over the healing and over the joy. And so I, I always advocate for my art and ensure that, you know, when people, you know, we talk about bio breaks in my interview at my current jobs, they were like, what do you do, you know, for um, self-care? And I was like, well, people have bio breaks. I need creative breaks. I need like a five minutes so I can go write a stanza and then come back to the work but I just need to go be in my art and then come back to the work. So that's all I add. I think what is important when we're talking about community is the idea of outreach. And I learned uh, in a few panels ago with Professor Andrew Roberts that um, outreach is a colonizing practice because once you outreach to a different community that you belong, like I, I am this human being, I don't belong to that community, but I'm going to go to that community and do my outreach and bring preservation to them. Uh, we need to be very careful and we need to um, care about communities at large, but you need to work, you need to understand who you are and you need to, you need to work within your community. Because once you do this outreach, you are like this person going to a different community to bring something new or to teach them how to do something. You have a responsibility and you are, um, recreating this colonial practice, right? So I think in this revolution of preservation, when we think about community, it's very important to do a lot of self-work and to understand like who I am, what, who can I speak with? Like what, who can uh, understand my experience, my experiences in life and what my experiences in life can bring to the people that I can create a community. So, um, to answer the question, like how to create a community, it's this self-work of being like who I am, who, who, what I believe in, what I want to do, and this will get, only that self-work will bring the community together. You don't need to do like outreach and be like, I'm going over there to that community to teach them how to do preservation or to tell them that this building needs to be saved or needs to be in the national register. So when we talk about community, I think it's important to uh, bring this idea that outreach and the community is where you belong to. It's not somewhere that you go and then you just uh, work with them. I agree with everything that's been said um, because this is a we're all agreeing with each other from our 20 minutes that we had however many weeks ago. Um, I think when you're when you're doing the kind of work that we're doing, I, I the, the phrase trauma bonding is a very useful one. Thank you for that, Richard. Because it's something that I've seen a lot in conversation, but joy bonding is far more powerful and makes much longer connections. I am in a Facebook group. Facebook's not great, but I'm in a Facebook group of Black historic interpreters. Um, so we have a lot of people who do um, who do costumed interpretation, who don't do it in terms of trying to tell these stories, but as Black people specifically. So there is conversation in there about like, oh, I dealt with this at work today. Oh, this particular thing happening in the political spectrum or the pop culture right now is really heavy for me right now. But at the same time, what I find like most useful in that group, aside from just the networking of all of that, is when we get to celebrate each other. 
whenever one of us is it is got selected to be like we're talking to a black interpreter in this national newspaper thing that thing goes off when any of us graduated with a degree it is we are all so excited and sending job stuff immediately uh, in terms of the community of care, which is the question that I'm trying to answer, um, I think what has been helpful for me, and I don't know if this works for everyone, so I won't represent, re uh, recommend it to everyone, but I got on Twitter before grad school, and so I watched a lot of those conversations about advocacy, about public history of preservation happen with adults, with um, professionals in, this, in that sphere before I got to grad school and then saw how they were teaching me this specifically here. And being able to see those conversations, see people agreeing and disagreeing with each other and celebrating things, but also like reveling in the fact that they are full human beings. Um, I, I'd say the two most pe the people I recommend the most uh, that I really emulated my Twitter presence on are talk about all sorts of things on there, not necessarily professionally. And if you go to my Twitter, you'll see that I'm talking about public history. So I'm talking about politics. You'll see I'm talking about Bob's Burgers sometimes because as a person, there's a lot, there's a lot to me, and I don't want to just be dealing with the fact that the world is sad today. History has made me depressed today. I also want to be excited about things because that's the thing that's most exciting. And when I get to uplift someone on any social media, that's the community that also then responds back to me. Uh, I am currently in the process of looking for work. And when I announced that on Twitter, and um, I did get a lot of responses like, oh, you should look in these places, and these are people you should talk to. The connection and the network that you build cares for you, can care for you professionally, can care for you emotionally. I've met some of my dearest friends in places like this, and those are all super strong bonds that can help care for you in so many ways that I don't think we are explicitly taught how to do. Like we learn how to make friends in some scenarios, but in terms of like building a community of care that helps you grow as a professional, as a person, and do what you need to do. It, we don't get like lessons specifically in that. And I think like once you start doing the kind of outreach and the kind of joy bond, then you can find ways to do things like that. I, I just, I, I want to point out right quick. I think someone mentioned, Sarah uh, mentioned that, you know, to, we have to acknowledge that, you know, students and recent graduates and young professionals have lost about 18 months of networking, um, at least in person, right? And I think it's so true. And I think there's there's something very powerful about some some of the social medias that connections that Lacey referred to, right? I will say that in so on social media, like I do not consider myself an influencer. Please don't call me that. And if you ever hear me call myself that, call me in, please. Because no, I think influencers are just micro institutions. And what? No, we're not about that. But I don't have a platform. I have a campaign. <laughs> no, just kidding. But I will say that you know. Over pandemic, I went from having like 3,000 followers to 13,000 followers to what people now call me a micro-influencer. And that allows for certain things like your swipe up features. It allows for certain different things, right? And I think it's super I, to acknowledge that it happened during quarantine because of this lack of 18 months or, or because of the, you know, not having this connection for 18 months. And people just thought me being a fool, really, because I'm a fool. And over this joy bonding, right? And I also just wanted to up, uh, uplift... Um, my colleagues in this panel for how we decided to unpanel it because we are real people right like I'm having dinner and we decided to hide cocktails because it's what brought us joy and it was like this is our joy and you get to see us and and then our work speaks for itself as well right so we get to be all these whole, whole people um, I want to comment on that, that like our work is our joy somebody asked about like uh, your art Jose, and how we uh, Lacey, Dale, and I, we, we use creativity in our outlet. And I yeah. think part of the revolution that we want is like to make the work creative, right? Preservation is this box side that you have to have a map and then you have to have historical records and then you have to have like a statement of importance and throw this out. We want to be creative. We want to, for example, Jose, we want to find a historic place and play like a show, a dance show in there. And this is historic preservation. We want to activate history. We want people to know history. We want people to participate in history. And I think uh, creativity is a very important part of this revolution that we are planning now because all of us, we are all very creative. Um, I have my own uh, creative outlets. I do a lot of graphic design and I do a lot of stuff with graphic design, uh, things related to historic preservation. But... Um, I think creativity is like 
in the core of the revolution, right? We need to make preservation be creative. It's not about researching, like having those steps. It's about activating history and letting people know that history belongs to the place. So what are your thoughts on creativity and the revolution? I really feel like we were gonna start with Richard there, um, but I can jump in. Um, creativity is crucial in the revolution because what we want in the revolution is many different ways to reach many different people. And to be able to do that, you need that creativity. Um, we all learned that like audio learners, visual learners, there's many different kinds of ways of learning, many different kinds of ways of expressing themselves and be able to do that creatively. Um, I, in my experience, uh, in terms of just like being a whole person, I, again, will recommend the fact that my Twitter is about full nonsense a lot of the time. Um, and it's good for me to have that outlet of just like nonsense. Um, I am currently working with a colleague of mine analyzing Falcon and the Winter Soldier's little Marvel miniseries because it's definitely about museums in a lot of ways that Disney wasn't going to delve into, but I will because I have time and I think it'll be fun. Um, things like that, like there's so many things in terms of creativity and just sometimes creativity isn't even just like the art of it, but just like the thought to ask a question that would let lean you more in this particular direction. I uh, currently have a, doing an oral history project, putting together these questions about women in politics, which caused me to ask questions about my own mother and grandmother's um, experience in voting in particular. And from that, literally yesterday, I'm like, oh, DC residents couldn't vote in like so many elections up until like 1970 something. I didn't know that. I grew up right outside DC. Of course, Montgomery County didn't teach that. That wasn't in their parameters of what we needed to know. But like, how much would our lives be different? How, 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 would, um, how would many of the conversations about DC statehood have gone differently if more people knew that? Because uh, like, honestly, that kind, of, that, that kind of just triggers like so many conversations and so many like upcoming uh, protests and ideas of what we could do and things that could happen just because I was working on a project decided to ask my grandmother a question and now I'm just like ooh, now where am I get where is this going to take it um creativity is crucial to the revolution and I I'm excited to see the many ways that other people will take it you want to go I Sure, it's it's like that back and forth. <laughs> um, I will say, and, and I'll speak to this differently, right? Because I definitely, everything that Lacey said, also the whole uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier and museum, yes, yes. Because um, I totally watched them, that's such a nerd. Um, but I think creativity is so important and I love the value of creativity. One, because that's how I thrive the most and the iterative process, the abstraction, the connections that you find. I know I'm a connector and one of my, rooms for growth is having to then explain the connection because they're random. But I will say that because going back to compartmentalization, there's a separate thing than I, than I do as an artist. And there is an opportunity for art and urban planning to come together. The most recent piece that I did was a, specifically, I love performance art because as performance artists, we are creating different conditions and we, one, we push our bodies to extremes. Marina Abramovic, Coco Fusco, uh, Gabriel G um, Gomez Peña, like, at now Bustamante, amazing performance artist. But there's something about that that we literally fic uh, fic what was that? Oh, Lord. physicalize like the, the world that we're trying to imagine. And then the performance art happens in the process of that physicalization, right? So we create these conditions. And so one of the things that I did was I did this piece called El Camino de Vermont, where I walked 13 miles across Los Angeles to bring visibility to the fact that there were still people riding public transit and that there were still people activating the sidewalk in the middle of a global pandemic. And planners weren't going to that, right? And so in that moment for me was like, as a planner, I shouldn't be thinking about investing in infrastructure. I should be thinking about removing stressors. And so this walk, I filmed it on a GoPro and I talked about the different stories and the stories were so fascinating. And now, for example, I'm dreaming this piece called Fenzilla. Now, what I'm imagining, y'all, this is amazing, but I'm imagining like doing a 3D model of the downtown LA skyline and like wearing some pink pumps, hence the femme and femzilla, and destroying every building from the newest build to the oldest build as a ritual of decolonization. And then people could have like 
different little neighborhoods. Like, let's destroy the Dodger Stadium. Let's destroy USC. And like, we need that joy and that anger. And it's like, what do we build, right? We don't allow for entropy and chaos to exist in our field. So I want to like that chaos theory that I saw that uh, Taylor wrote. I'm like, I'm here for it. So let's destroy built environments. Not like real ones, just models and then imagine new ones. <laughs> Love that. Um, I, Lacey, I wanted to bring up something that you said, because every time someone talks about creativity, I get really nervous because I wouldn't consider myself a creative person, like dancing, art, nothing. Like I barely can write. <laughs> just, Excuse me. You came up with all the themes for side B and they're very creative. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I'm always thinking like, how do I describe the creativity that I have? Cause it's not like a traditional art that I could put my hands on. And you said, I wrote it down. Um, creativity isn't about the art of it, but the creativity to ask the question. And I think that's something like, if you're like me and you're like, I can't graphic design, I can't do these, I can't do things like your thoughts are creative. And I think that's so essential for you to know and to have value in, but I can't put them, you know, like into words, into art or to whatever, but I have these really creative thoughts and that's where community and collaboration comes in for me. It's like, oh, I know that I have this vision and Eduardo is amazing and he can make that vision come true and add his own to it. So just wanted to add my little two cents on there. Um, I think we had another question. Do we want to ask the next, next one or did anyone have anything else to say? Good, okay. Um, someone said a while ago, going back to the roles of institutions and revolution, how do we bring in debates from different disciplines? Not just taking the first or most popular ideas, but actively engaging in the debates to understand the power of institutions in the field and the implications that has on taking these institutions to task. Let me reread that, hold on. How do we bring in debates from different disciplines? Um, can you clarify like different disciplines like preservation adjacent, like city planning or just like science? What, what are we thinking? Does anyone have an interpretation on that? I think it's a dope question. I just wanna make sure I'm answering it correctly. Maybe, maybe it is that different disciplines, maybe not. I think there's room for adjacent and non-adjacent. For me, I, I always think about as an artist, the metaphor. Like we as artists have the power of the metaphor and the metaphor allows us to understand certain social conditions or social contracts that are happening. We then deconstruct, right? And then we have to rebuild another social construct to create that bridge for community sometimes, right? So the example that I think about all the time, I love to talk about, y'all, it is foreign and sitting, and I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's, oh. But um, I think a lot about, for example, what happens if you look at uh, transportation as the choreography of the city, right? And, and then look into choreography. We look about, we think about rhythm. We think about cadence. We think about um, uh, composition and all those th different things. So there's an opportunity there to think about the transportation in a different form where we think about it as a dance or when we think about intersections as joints. This is my favorite metaphor. So joints, for example, allow nutrients to come in and through and from different parts of the body we also provide something that's called viscosity. Basically, what this means is like when you're going to jump, people tell you to bend your knees so that your joints provide viscosity and all the pressure doesn't impact your bone and you don't hurt yourself. Now, if we think about hurting yourself as traffic co uh, co collisions, how do we provide viscosity in, in intersections? We already have a treatment for that. It's called the roundabout. The roundabout stops the tra flow traffic and reduces the number of points of, of conflict that a car can have so that th that's viscosity. So there's this metaphor and you're like, wait, what? The roundabout is a joint? And you're like, yes, it is. And so I think that the power of metaphor can really help us be bridges uh, and translators between different fields. And there's always a synergy where we can learn from. Um, I think you said something very important for the revolution is that uh, society operates in social constructs, right? So I think we need to be clear in the revolution that we are not uh, getting rid of social constructs, uh, constructs because we need them to operate. We need uh, people to believe in our stories and in what we're doing, and this is a social construct. Um, I think the revolution that we are planning is just like allowing multiple social constructs to exist at the same time, right? And I think that's a very good point that you made, uh, Jose, thank you. 
I think we're still waiting on whether we're talking about adjacent or non-adjacent. But I think if we're thinking about like the true understanding of democracy, of everyone having a voice, we want to have as many voices as we can leading these discussions. And uh, in terms of having those in institutions, I think honestly, you just need to sort of reach to just reach out to the to people and see if they'll do it. If I wanted to have a program where we discuss, say, a statue, I would definitely want a historian to tell me who, who the statue is, what this person did, and why that matters. Want an artist to tell me why this statue is made this way and why that's important. I want someone to tell me the pop culture re relevancy of this statue. Could I have a scientist there to tell me about how marble even works, because I know very little about marble. I think there's a lot of, if you pick the right subject, you can find enough people to talk, to have an opinion on it. Like people have opinions about all sorts of random, honestly, useless things. Well, um, we give them something that's important to talk about. I think there's a lot of opportunities to do that. Ooh, running on time. <laughs> that's an amazing point. I never thought about that as like, we're engaging in these debates, but are also like proving our points. And it's a point of collaboration at the same time, like together, not apart. Um, does anyone like, oh, this clarification? Ba, ba, ba. Oh, okay. I like that. Um, if anyone else has any questions for us as panelists, do you want to know anything else about one another? Because I have something I want to do praise for Lacey. Um, because I did not know until I read your bio way too late in the game after we had already got you to be on this panel that you did the Owens Thomas house. And I went on to went to Savannah like two years ago. It was like a solo trip that I went and I fell in love with that place. Like I thought the interpretation was beautiful. I thought everything about it was perfect. And I was like, this is how you do preservation adaptation. Like this is just the peak of it all. And since then, like, since I went, I think I presented on that house and that interpretation project like four times. And even to get the job that I had, they had me do a presentation on something that was important to me. And I did it on Owens Thomas house. So I do want to give you like hard praise for that because that was phenomenal and the work that you do is phenomenal and it directly impacted me and I can't even believe we're here I feel like I'm out of celebrities like home <laughs> so I want to thank you for that um and then answer any more questions celebrity in a very limited field like I'm a public historian celebrity it's still very specific um but I'm glad you enjoyed it I really glad I was always glad when I had someone who really appreciated the kind of tours that we were doing there so I, I am taking this compliment thank you and Jose had to leave us. Um, I don't, should we end early or is there anything else any of us want to ask? Sarah, what do you think? I'm going to join in. Oh. <laughs> okay. You got me fired up. You've gone scorched earth. Um, and we still have some questions. Um, I think Jeremy's question, and Jeremy is an academic, Jeremy works for a uh, university. I think it is worth exploring how the not just you Taylor but you know how the preservation programs shaped our collective work what was the difficult aspects to it and the challenges and you know what would make you maybe or not recommend your program to somebody and it's okay if you don't want to share the full story but I think it's really important like I will say that like when I saw you two went to a very expensive program, I'm like, why does anybody go to that program if they want to work in preservation? We're not making enough for that. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, can you say the last, what do you want me to answer? <laughs> like, Just like, you know, for the people out there in the world who are working for the institutions and, you know, we hear time and time again, well, we're having trouble with recruitment but that's because of how we welcome people. So how can we collectively do better at fostering a preservation community yeah. for the emerging professionals? Eduardo and I are actually working directly with our alma mater on these things. It's going quite slowly as you could expect any institution and bureaucracy to go, but where we're, it's like a twofold approach for you. One, it's training and it's making sure that you're, the people who are teaching have the 
the basics of like understanding the field and having a critical thought about the field. And you would be amazed how many of our professors, you could be like, so how does race come into play with this? Okay, how does race come to play into this data, to this policy? And they'll just stare at you like, that's a great question. You should figure that out. But it's like the people who teach us don't have that basic systemic knowledge. And that goes hand in hand with curriculum. Like if you're not learning about it and your professors don't know about it, you're screwed from the start. So something that's important for us that we've been working with our institution on is is, okay, does your faculty have training? Do they understand like the basics of r racism in the field? And are is that recognized in the curriculum? And then can you have discussions in your classroom about those things? Because you might have students come in who don't know anything and who know everything and you're relying on the students to train other students to train the professors about those things. And so it's like, it's systemic, it's personal, it's individual, it's all of the things at once. And that's something that we're trying to become I guess experts in that we're just starting out in is there's so many ways to tackle it and you have to tackle it on all fronts or you're just going to be stuck in the cycle. Uh, yes, I want to also give my one cent is that um, this is something particular to the United States that um, the United States attracts a lot of international students, right? It's part of like the universities and institutions to do the outreach to different countries. And I have to say that institutions are not prepared to receive international students. Mm -hmm. um, I heard from a professor being like, you are too Brazilian, you know? And I was like, yeah, and I'm proud to be very, very Brazilian. I'll be Brazilian in every single way I can. And um, it just shows like this unpreparedness to deal with the diversity and the um, different voices that the institutions are trying to get. And, um, but I would say like, uh, I saw the question, like a comment on how faculty can do better is, um, I believe in the power of listening. So if faculty just steps, uh, give like a step back and is, instead of being the talker to being like the presenter, the people giving the lecture, step back and listen and be like, okay, so what my students have to say about their experiences or what heritage means to them, or if in Brazil heritage is different, how can I learn from that and incorporate that to my to my um, classes? So I think that's like the first step to being to be more in the position to listen than to just speak and give lectures. Because I believe in education as a exchange, way more than like one person giving the knowledge to the group. So um, for faculty and for institutions, I would say step back and just listen to what people have to say because you're not here to change your world. We are here to change your world, right? Um, and yeah, I think that this is my two cents. And Lacey, I'd love to ask you, you know, I feel like you're the self-identified public historian, but when I luckily got to connect to you online, you know, you were a bit trepidatious, like going to the, your first National Trust for Historic Preservation Conference. Like you were like, am I even a preservationist when like, yes, public history is preservation and vice versa. Like how can us preservationists like build that bridge and finally stop pretending like only buildings exist you know like how do we better fuse the two you know frames of thought and the two different trainings that overlap in so many ways right you and i have talked about this several times about how our fields are far more similar than the than we than they are different and yet we don't talk about it like in the open or in our training in the same way i went to a public history a program that focused on public history the UNCG has like a preservationist uh, program that didn't was was like I don't know what state it's in right now, but it was not in a good state when I went there. So I didn't know any of those students, um, despite the fact that they were right in like two buildings away, more than likely. Um, I think speak speaking as the only public historian, so therefore I can speak as all public historians. What public historians and I think preservationists care about are stories. Stories are what's important stories that have consequences. And then where we differ in terms of like training is just like, well, how do we preserve these stories? Public historians are like, let me just tell you absolutely everything that I know and how that all connects. That's all true and that's all helpful. Preservation is like, we need to preserve what we have, 
in whatever spaces that we have so we can continue to do that. They're shaking hands more than anything else, but we each think we're doing the wrong handshake sometimes. Uh, and so that's a very weird metaphor. But I think communication is like one of the more useful things in terms of that, like just realizing that we have more in common than we don't. Um, I, I, I think, because I definitely did have trepidation. I was like, I don't know any preservationists. I don't know how to, I, I, I'm sure that, that they seem like nice people. I, they, they, they're, they're interacting with me very nice online. I, I don't, that I, that I had, but I don't know what their training's like. I don't know what, what, um, what differs or what's the same. And then when you start talking to them, almost like you, talk, you start talking to anyone, you're like, oh, we have more in common than we think coming into this. Um, I would say then just that sort of communication and at whatever level we want to start any kind of training. Like I'm very open to the conversation about like maybe we don't need to pay exorbitant amounts of money for master's and postgraduate degrees because that's a lot of money. But whatever part of the education level we start thinking about these kind of things, whatever point we start, we should probably be like, by the way, y'all are actually the same. Just keep in mind that you guys are actually just the same. Don't, 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 don't be, um, I don't think anyone's being, I don't know of anyone being antagonistic, but don't be confused. You guys are all trying to do the same thing. I feel like I've had similar conversations with librarians, honestly. We're all just cousins in humanities, just try, all fighting over the same limited funding and yet all trying to do the same thing. One of the best conferences I've ever gone to is for librarians and archivists. It was awesome. I believe well, it. But this is a nice segue to a question from YouTube from Andrew Hart. He goes, revolutionaries, what course or non-courses would you present in the open university of preservation revolution of the future? All right, so you all are in charge of one chorus to, that all of us need to attend. What is the name of that course? And maybe a couple sentence descriptions. Okay, immediate idea, because we already do this, and this is something I'm passionate about. I am super big into getting your own, getting to know your own neighborhood and creating your own historic preservation tour. Like, I think that's the coolest, dopest, most local thing you could do that's super easy. So I would do, like, preservation side B or, like, a side B of the tour of your neighborhood or your community or where you live in, and then do, like, basic mapping courses, things like that, that you have to learn in preservation, and then everyone has to do their own tour. I would definitely um this is kind of weird because i'm gonna mention one of the worst class that we had it was called it was called uh concepts of heritage it was terrible but i really like this idea of having people defining what is heritage for them and working around those many different concepts of heritage and understanding them and discussing them and making the point that all of them are valid and important. The class that we had was not that. It was more like, no, you're wrong. So <laughs> um, I will copy that name because I, I, I was really excited for this, this class, it didn't go the way that I expected. But um, I think for the revolution, this is important, like the acknowledgement that preservation is not one thing. And to the point from uh, for the previous question, like everyone, is a preservationist, right? We don't need a degree in preservation to be a preservationist. So Lacey is a preservationist as much as I am. And just uh, hearing like different points of view and different um, aspects of preservation that you didn't even think about, that would be amazing for me. And that would be a class that I, I want to teach someday. Happy to be welcomed as a preservationist. Um, I think very similar to Taylor's in terms of just like, instead of just a tour of the neighborhood, I would just have these variants of students pick a building or pick a story in their neighborhood and then give me a podcast episode about that. I did a project in American Studies at UMBC about that, where we just tracked a main street in Curtis Bay, Maryland and businesses that left and went and businesses that stayed. And you can learn so much about a place in terms of just like focusing on like what happened in this building over like this many years. Let me tell you about this story about this one guy over here. I think you can real, it's a good thing. I'm definitely thinking about my own experience in a sense, because like there's so much I've learned about Silver Spring, Maryland after I've left it. That, that, that's so interesting to me. And just like being able to like focus on like the many different nuances of just a town, like tell me about 
the different immigrant groups that are maybe that came to come to your town in particular that maybe aren't as focused in other places. Tell me about at a local election. I think there's there's so much in terms of just keeping it open of just like let's focus in on one place and let's expand beyond that. I love that. So I'm gonna bring forth a question. I want you to chew on it a little bit while I ramble. Um, so I want us to end with how do we keep this conversation going? How do we maintain steam while well, resting? But, you know, we can even see in the past year when we look at our professional organizations, when we look at the social media groups, you know, there is steam being lost in terms of expanding the narrative. There is steam being lost in terms of how we need to shift and move preservation forward. Some of that may just be pandemic exhaustion. Some of that may be Zoom burnout, who knows what it is, but how do we best keep the conversation going? So chew on that for just a couple seconds while I remind our wonderful attendees, um, all of the sessions except for one are up on YouTube now for you to already go back and stream. I truly hope you all will choose to go back and view valuable conversations that have been had this week. I am not blowing smoke when I say that the work being done by the emerging preservationists with backgrounds in everything from sociology to Mexican American studies to preservation to just being grassroots activists with their lived experiences, you know, really valuable projects being showcased throughout this week that to me reflect the future of preservation in ways that can motivate and inspire you. So don't forget there's recordings. You can listen to them while washing the dishes. You can put them in your headphones while vacuuming your house. You know, these are um, conversations that we can all learn from. And I'm very pleased to have hosted the event again this year and to have you all here listening to a conversation like this one. All right. So how do we keep this conversation going? We've gotten some food for thought. So what's next? Can I start? Um, I would say, first of all, uh, support the work of uh, the people that are doing the revolution. So go uh, to Laces LinkedIn and Twitter and follow her. Uh, go to preserva at Preservation Side B on Instagram and follow us with at preservationsideb.com. Um, and this support is very important for people doing the work, for people who are not tired. We're not expecting we're not expecting everyone to keep on working every time. Um, but one thing, and I'll, I'll get very, I'll, I'll give like a personal example. I was tired of listening about sustainability and how we can save the world and all that. So I just decided there is a piece of land behind my building that nobody was taking care of. And I was just like, okay, that would be a good project for me to just go weed the, this piece of land and put like some flowers, some uh, pollinator flowers so I can save the bees, for example. So I just like try to get the activism and apply for something um, uh, practical in your life that will keep the work going and that will keep you uh, involved and active in the discussions. Lacey, you want to go or you want me to go? I can go. I, I think it kind of goes back to the conversation that we had about creativity, about asking the right questions or however better way I put it in that moment. I think what we're doing in this conversation at this conference and collectively in a variety of ways through this unconference is having the conversation and, ha and asking the right questions. There's more questions to be had because as we continue to talk to each other, more questions will come up. Uh, and then we'll realize how connected we further are. And honestly, sometimes more connected in terms of just um, physically. Uh, I wonder if there's a way to connect all the people who went to this conference with uh, people who were in particular regions. So we can be like, oh, hey, all of us were at this conference. We all happen to live in North Carolina right now. We should hit up somewhere and just hang, figure out how we can rest better, figure out how many projects we want to invest in. Um, just really just be very vocal about what our community of this unconference needs to become a better community of care. Um, that may involve following my Twitter. It does not have to. It can involve a lot of things. Uh, but I think there's a lot of, but I think in terms of just asking the right questions and figuring out how best to do that, because I don't think everyone uh, 
uh, I don't think everyone follows the right things. I don't think everyone, I don't think every thing that we'll suggest will work for everyone, which is why these conversations are so useful. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I think there's, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I don't know if I answered that question. Um, I have two things. So I, being a part of a institution who's losing its steam with the Black Lives Matter anti-racism shit, like that's going to lose steam, but find a value that you want to fight for and choose your own revolution. You can, you don't have to preserve the world, but you can preserve what's closest to you. And two, I'm, my gears are turning. I think that we should start some sort of community of care. So if you are interested in that, let us know. But like, I'm inspired to to literally create the space that we need to continue this conversation. So if you are interested in that, please email us, like hit us up on Instagram, do whatever you need to do. But like, I think that's my calling. I'm starting community of care. I'm saying it now is you have to hold me to it. <laughs> we already have people signing up in the comments. So yeah, you gotta make it happen. So oh, thank you so much, all of you for closing out the week for me. Um, been wonderful hearing this conversation. We all need it. Uh, we need to not feel alone. And I hope that Dismantle Preservation played a tiny role in that. And I will say next year, um, we will have two in-person events. They're going to be small, intimate experiences, meaning like not more than 30 people, because our standard conference format with hundreds and hundreds of people is not necessarily conducive to developing relationships. So I want to create in-person events where we can truly bond over experiential learning opportunities. So I'm excited to have seed funding for that, thanks to the 1772 Foundation. Um, and you'll hear more about that in the coming months. And one of them will be in North Carolina. So Lacey, I'll see you there. So thank you everyone so much for being here. Um, there will be a recap email on Monday, but I hope everybody takes the weekend to recharge, digest, and we'll kick off next week uh, with the revolution. Thank you, Sarah, for putting this on. We appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. 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 <laughs> Have a great week.